is this is professor yeah this is professor oito pater who from angolia uh today first of all i would like i hope uh, is everyone is doing well and healthy today uh webinar uh, meeting is uh, uh, I and my co-chair, Professor Manoj Kumar, will moderate today's webinar meeting. Uh, today, uh, Professor uh, uh, Patricia Farsi talk about hepatitis, delta virus infection, and hepatitis carcinoma. Uh, now, I would like to introduce is Professor Patricia Farsi. Uh, she is the chief of hepatic pathogen section of the laboratory of infectious diseases, NIH and allergy and infectious diseases, NIH, uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Professor Farsi has completed her first doctorate fellow at the Department of Gastroenterology of the Malinit Hospital in Torina, in the laboratory uh, of Professor Maria Rizzetto, uh, then at the Department of Medicine uh, at the Royal Free Hospital in London under Professor uh, Sheila Sherlock. Uh, she is a member of many uh, professional societies and fellow uh, of the American Association for the Study of the Liver Diseases. Uh, her research has been focused on, on the study on the pathogenesis, natural history, and treatment of acute and chronic viral hepatitis. Today, Professor Patricia, Patricia Farsi talk about HDV and HCC. <laughs> Professor Patricia Farsi, please welcome. Can you hear me, Professor Patricia? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, finally. <laughs> okay, okay, my camera, where is the camera? Um, okay. Oh. Okay, please, we okay. please welcome. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the video. Okay. Okay, so good evening and welcome to everyone around the world. And thank you, Dr. Bataku, for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to present our work on hepatitis D virus and hepatocellular carcinoma. And I would like to thank the organizing committee of the APAS for giving me this opportunity. Although there has been a dramatic progress in the diagnosis, treatment and prevention of acute and chronic viral hepatitis, there is no doubt that HCC remains one of the most important challenges for the scientific community. So today I will focus my talk on the role of HTV in HCC for which there is very limited information. And I will start by discussing very briefly the unconventional nature of HTV, which is critical for understanding the disease caused by this virus. Why is not moving now? I'm sharing. I'm sorry, I need to go with the slides. Why is not moving? Okay. So uh, HTV, since the early studies, uh, the Delta virus turned out to be one of the most uh, unique virus in animal virology. And due to its uniqueness, uh, HTV has been classified as the prototype 
and sole member of the Delta virus genus. The virus is a 36 nanometer particle encapsulated by HBSIG provided by HBV. It is the only animal virus to possess a single-stranded circular RNA genome of negative polarity and is of 1.7 kb, thus it is the smallest genome of any known animal viruses. It contains a single operating frame that encodes the hepatitis delta antigen and it replicates it through a rolling circle mechanism. Eight genotypes have been described that differ in their global distribution. Indeed, the most peculiar feature of this virus is the fact that it is a defective virus that requires HBV for its uh, uh, transmission. In another important feature of this virus is the fact that it is highly pathogenic and it causes acute, often fulminant hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular So this is a schematic representation of the virus as shown here. And the, the virus is a 36 nanometer particle and containing, it contains in its interior the RNA genome, the circular RNA genome, and the hepatitis delta antigen that are encapsulated by HBSAG. So the envelope protein, which is required for virion formation and the infection, is the only HBV contribution to the HTV life cycle. So as I said before, beside its uniqueness, this virus is highly pathogenic. And as you can see, HTV causes the least common but most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis, leading to cirrhosis in up to 80% of cases within five to 10 years. And once cirrhosis is established, a high proportion of the patients eventually die of liver decompensation or hepatocellular carcinoma, unless underwent the liver transplantation. However, the precise number of the patients who develop each of these long-term complications remain uncertain due to the lack of large prospective studies on the natural history of HTV. Importantly, Cirrhosis is the single most important risk factor for HCC being present in over 80-90% of the cases. And this is common also to the other viruses, especially HCV and HTV. Thus, two major questions remain to be fully elucidated. First, is HTV a carcinogenic virus to humans? And second, does HDV increase the risk of HCC compared to HBV mononfection? As I said, there is very limited information of the role, on the role of HDV in hepatocarcinogenesis. However, epidemiological and clinical evidence suggest that HCV is also a carcinogenic virus. In one longitudinal analysis of 200 Western European patients with compensated type B cirrhosis, including 39 co-infected with HDV, the adjusted relative risk of HCC was threefold higher and that of decompensation and liver-related mortality twofold higher in HDV cirrhosis than in HBV cirrhosis during a median follow-up of 6.6 years. Now, the increased risk was also confirmed in a large nationwide retrospective study that analyzed more than 2,000 veterans in the United States, where the HDV positive status was independently associated with HCC 
And interestingly, the association was also independent of the presence of cirrhosis, suggesting that HTV may be also directly oncogenic. Now, the risk of HDV with HCC was also confirmed in a Swedish study. They reported that the risk of HCC among patients with HBV and HDV was increased when patients with chronic HBV infection alone were used as the reference population. And uh, they concluded that their findings indicated that HDV is a strong risk factor for HCC. However, I would like to point out that there is a, a strong limitation of all of these studies. And the limitation is the fact that these were all retrospective studies. Unfortunately, large prospective studies on the natural history of HDV infection are missing. Now, very interesting observations concerning the role of HDV in HCC came from studies in Mongolia, which has the highest incidence of HCC worldwide, four times higher, higher than in other Asian countries. As you can see, whereas in China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand, and India, HBV is responsible for more than 70% of HCC cases. In Mongolia, HBV accounts for only 3% of the cases. In contrast, HDV is the second most represented virus, either alone or with HCV. And I have always found very intriguing that in Mongolia, which borders with China, HBV plays such a minor role. Conversely, HDV does not seem to be highly prevalent or to play a major role in China. Thus, what is the role of HDV in hepatocellular carcinoma? Because of the vital dependence of HDV on HBV, the specific role of HDV in promoting HCC is unknown. There are limited data on how on the mechanism whereby HDV may induce hepatocarcinogenesis. And in addition, it is unknown whether HCC is an effect of the underlying cirrhosis of a direct oncogenic effect of HDV or of a cumulative oncogenic effect of HPV and HDV. Thus, we started a series of studies to investigate the molecular pathogenesis of HDV associated with hepatocellular carcinoma by studying simultaneously both the virus and the host. And we're very interested also in dissecting the role of HDV by comparing the results of HDV HCC cases versus HBV monoinfected HCC. And this slide shows the design of our study. In collaboration with Dr. Fausto Zamboni from Cagliari in Sardinia, Italy, we designed a study in which we studied a total of 35 liver specimens derived from five well-characterized patients with HDV HCC obtained at the time of liver transplantation. Their mean age was 57 years and all were males. So these are all patients from the same center, all collected in Italy in Sardinia. As a control group, we also studied 28 liver specimens from seven patients with non HCC cirrhosis who underwent liver transplantation for end stage liver disease. The age was similar, but in this group of patients, there was nearly 43% of females. Now, each specimen was divided in two, 
one half was not frozen for molecular studies, while the other one was formally fixed uh, for pathological examination. Each specimen was carefully examined by two expert uh, hepatopathologists, the Dr. Kleining from, uh, Kleiner from the National Cancer Institute and Dr. Govidarajan from the University of Southern California. And importantly, specimens showing a mixed population of tumor and the non-tumor, especially the one around the tumor, were excluded from this analysis. Now, the availability of this unique collection of liver samples provided us with a unique opportunity to study both the viral and the host factors, both within and outside the tumor. And let's start with the viral factors. All liver specimens were analyzed for the levels of intrahepatic HPV RNA, HPV DNA by PCR, and by immunohistochemistry, we detect the presence for HBCIG, hepatitis B core antigen, and hepatitis delta antigen. Now, this slide shows the HBV and HDV serology. Regarding the serologic HBV profile, there was no difference between the two groups of patients. And as expected, all were positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HB positive and negative for the antigen, positive for anti-core, but all negative for IgM anti-core. Now, the levels of serum HPV DNA were very low in all cases. Now, regarding HDV, all were positive for serum HDV RNA and IgG anti-Delta, whereas IgM anti-Delta was positive only in three HCC cases, but in all patients with uh, HDV cirrhosis. Next, we, if you look at the levels of HDV RNA and HPV DNA, in the liver, you can see that the levels in orange is indicated the tumor and in blue, the surrounding non-tumorous tissue. As you can see, the levels of HDV RNA within the tumor were remarkably lower than in the surrounding non-tumorous tissue in two patients. Whereas similar levels were detected between tumor and non-tumor in the remaining patients. Overall, the levels of HTV RNA tended to be higher in HTV cirrhosis compared to patients with HCC, with no difference in HTV cirrhosis between the right and the left lobe, which, is, which are indicated by different shades of blue. Now, the levels of intrahepatic HPV DNA were also very low in both groups consistent with the low levels of HBV DNA replications that are commonly seen in chronic hepatitis D. Next, uh, we performed immunohistochemical staining of HBV and HDV antigens in the tumor, non-tumor, and in non-HCC cirrhosis. We found that core antigen Staining was negative in all but one patient with uh, HDV cirrhosis, a finding that is consistent with the low level of HBV replication that I show you just uh, in the previous slide. Within the HDV tumor, HPCRG and delta antigen were detected in two and three patients respectively whereas the prevalence of these markers was considerably higher in the non-tumor as well as in non-HCC cirrhosis. This is just an example of a patient with HDV associated HCC. As you can see in the tumor, both HBSG and delta antigen were not detected by immunohistochemistry. 
although the biopsy was pretty big. Whereas in the surrounding non-tumorous tissue, you can clearly see HBCIG and also several nuclear of hepatitis delta antigen. However, the expression of HBCIG and also of the delta antigen, as you can see here in the nuclear stain by brown, was considerably higher in patients with the HDV cirrhosis. Now let's move on to discuss the host factors. Gene expression profiling was performed on all liver tissue, but also on laser capture microdissected hepatocytes. And selected samples were also used to perform RNA-seq and all exome sequencing, but these uh, data, these analyses are in progress. So today I will focus on transcriptomics. And this is the study design. Gene expression profiling was performed in all 35 liver specimens using RNA extracted from all liver tissue. So there was everything, all the liver. In addition, because the liver contains a very heterogeneous population, we perform also gene expression profiling in laser capture microdissected hepatocytes, both in the tumor and in the surrounding non-tumorous tissue from paired liver sample, including the center of the tumor, as you can see here, and the most distant non-tumorous tissue. So let's start to see the results. As a first step to examine the relationship among the samples, we perform an unsupervised multidimensional scaling plot of all the samples obtained from all liver tissue and the surrounding non-tumorous tissue. And I want to point out that each dot represents a single liver specimen. Now the plot clearly shows how the gene expression profiling completely separates the tumor, as you can see here, from the non-tumorous areas with two distinct clusters. And as you can see, these two clusters were also maintained both in the case of laser capture microdissection that is defined as LCM, as well as in, with the all liver tissue, as you can see, LCM here, LCM here, all liver tissue, all liver tissue, suggesting that all liver tissue and laser capture microdissection share a large number of differentially expressed genes. And I want also to point out that this separation was but obtained using an unsupervised, so all the, all the genes were inside, put it inside without the previous statistical analysis. So next, to identify the genes that were responsible for the difference between tumor and non-tumorous areas, we used a multivariate permutation test with a fall discovery rate lower than 1%. As you can see, a total of 385 genes differentially expressed between the tumor and non-tumorous areas using all liver tissue were identified. Importantly, the vast majority, 77% of the genes are shown in blue, were down-regulated genes, whereas the minority, 23%, as shown in red, were up-regulated. Thus, this data indicates that the tumor is associated with a gene down-regulation. Now, if you look at the data obtained by laser capture microdissection, Comparison of malignant versus non-malignant hepatocytes identified a higher number of genes differentially expressed, 547 versus 385. 
But again, the vast majority of genes were downregulated, nearly 70%. And as you can see, nearly 200 genes were in common between Oliver tissue and laser capture microdissection. But again, the majority of these in common genes were downregulated. 64%. Next, we perform the heat map of the 547 genes differentially expressed between malignant, that is defined as MH, malignant hepatocytes, and non malignant hepatocytes, NMH, so tumor, non tumor. And each column, as you can see here, represents a different patient. This each number is a patient, both within the tumor and the corresponding non-tumorous tissue. So this is a patient 104, tumor 104, surrounding non-tumorous tissue. And each row represents the level of expression of a single gene. Now, according to the color scale, Upregulated genes are shown in shades of red, as you can see here, down here, and here, here, red, and downregulated genes in shades of green. Now, if as you can see, the heat map clearly shows a sharp separation between the tumor and the non-tumor. Genes that were upregulated in the tumor were downregulated in the non tumorous areas. And genes that were upregulated in the tumor areas were downregulated outside. Now, as you can see, the tumor was characterized by the color green, which means that most of the genes were downregulated. And the ones that were downregulated in the tumor were upregulated in all the surrounding non-tumorous areas. Thus, we want to understand which were these genes. And we use ingenuity pathway analysis to investigate the pathways and function of the genes significantly associated with HDV associated hepatocellular carcinoma. And let me show you the most important pathways that we found within hepatos HDV HCC. The bar, let's explain it this slide. The bars, top axis, indicate the ratio between the number of genes in a given pathway and the total number of genes that make up that pathway. And important, within each bar, the red and blue colors indicate the proportion of up and down regulated genes respectively. Now, the yellow dotted line, which is this one, bottom axis, shows the log of a p-value calculated by Fisher exact test. Now, the most significant finding in HTV HCC was the presence of six pathways. As you can see here, Sonic Edgecock, GAD45, DNA damage, cycling and cell cycle regulation, cell cycle G2, mDNA damage, checkpoint, which is a checkpoint regulation, and a hereditary breast cancer signal. With the vast majority, and this is very important, of upregulated genes in several involved in several interrelated functions inherent to cell cycle DNA replication, DNA damage, and repair. These were the three most important. Now, considering that most of the genes, sorry, now considering that most of the genes are downregulated within the tumor, nearly 
70%, it is remarkable that the vast majority of genes involved in these six pathways were mostly or all upregulated. This one, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Other significant pathways include hepatic fibrosis and hepatic stellate cell activation with all genes downregulated, suggesting that the production of extracellular matrix was indeed inhibited within the tumor. Then we have STAT3 pathway and the few metabolism associated pathways. Also, this is important why a little time. And these uh, metabolism associated the pathways include amino acid metabolism, histidine degradation, lipid metabolism, eicosanoid signaling, and estrogen biosynthesis. Thus, the molecular signature, just the hallmark of HTV hepatocellular carcinoma was characterized by an enrichment of upregulated genes involved in cell cycle DNA replication, DNA damage and repair. How do you call this the hallmark of HTV HCC? And we perform four independent analysis of malignant hepatocytes using the laser capture microdissected results, which include the canonical pathways, biological functions, relational networks, and co-regulation clusters. This analysis indicated that the proliferation of tumoral cells is associated with dysregulation of genes that control genome instability. And these genes modulated the mechanism that recognize DNA damage, prevent cells with damaged DNA from entering mitosis or promote DNA repair. Now, details of this analysis have been recently published by our group in Molecular Cancer Research. Now, another complication for understanding the pathogenesis of HDV is the fact that HDV is a defective virus that always coexists with HBV. So, because we want to dissect the role of HDV, we compare the results of gene expression profiles in HCC associated with HDV plus HBV versus HBV mononfected. So, remarkably, among the six pathways involved in cell cycle DNA replication, DNA damage and repair detected in HDV, HCC, none of these six pathways were found in HBV malignant hepatocytes because we have performed also laser capture microdissection on HBV associated hepatocellular carcinoma. Interestingly, in HBV we found that the first top score canonical pathways were, were Simply only one path, which is estrogen biosynthesis, was in common between HDV and, HC, and HBV. In contrast to HDV, HBV associated HCC was characterized by a metabolism switch off with a prevalence of downregulated genes, as shown by the blue bars, which are pre pre prevalent mostly involved in the metabolism of lipids and fatty acids, glucose, amino acids, and drugs. So remarkably, none of the six pathways involved in cell cycle, DNA replication, damage and repair detect in HTVHCC 
none of them was found in HBV malignant hepatocytes. The molecular pathways of HBV malignant hepatocytes, of course, compared to the surrounding non-tumorous areas, were primarily, primarily associated with the metabolic processes, retinoic acid receptor, cell remodeling, and motility functions. Thus, our study demonstrated that despite the dependence of HDV on HBV, our findings suggest that the molecular signature of HDVHCC is markedly different from that of HBV HCC, and that genetic instability is a specific feature of HDV associated HCC. So, in summary, this is the first study that integrates gene expression profiling of a whole liver tissue with that of microdissected hepatocytes. HDV was associated with the activation of pathways mostly related to DNA damage and repair. And importantly, we found that there was not only activation, but also co-regulation of the same genes associated with DNA replication, damage, and repair, which pointed to genome instability as a key mechanism of HDV hepatocarcinogenesis. Now, although patients with HDV HCC also harbor HBV, distinct molecular mechanisms appear to be involved in HDV, HBV hepatocarcinogenesis. And further studies are in progress to dissect the relative role of HBV and HDV in liver cancer. Also, I want to add that the number of hepatocytes expressing HBSG and delta antigen was lower in the tumor than in surrounding non-tumorous tissue, suggesting that malignant hepatocytes express or lack factors that may regulate viral entry or replication, and we are investigating these aspects. So in conclusion, the study of multiple liver specimens, both within the tumor and the neighboring and distant and non-tumor tissue, may help to identify genes that are important for, first, elucidation of the molecular pathogenesis of HDV-associated HCC, identification of new diagnostic markers that may predict the development of HCC or permit an early diagnosis. And of course, uh, this is just the first step and all genome sequencing and RNA-seq are in progress to identify genomic alterations for understanding pathogenesis and opening new avenues for the treatment of HDV associated hepatocellular carcinoma. And finally, I would like to thank a lot of people that collaborated and were played a major role in generation of all this data I presented today. I want to say that a particular thanks goes to Fausto Zamboni, the director of the Liver Transplantation Center in Italy, which provides us with these very precious samples. And also Giacomo Diaz, the laser capture microdiaxation of the National Cancer Institute, both Dr. Kleiner and Suganta Govindarajan, the two hepatopathologists, and all my group that, uh, uh, of course, from my section contributed uh, largely to the generation of this data. And also, I want to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to present our work. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patricia Farsi, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now it's open discussion time. Professor Manacho Kumar, please. Yeah, yeah. 
So um, that was a really nice lecture uh, on HDB and HCV with a lot of work being shown by Professor Patricia. So we have many questions coming from the audience. The first question is from Dr. Mukul Rastogi, who asked that can HDB co-infection occur with any other virus besides HBV that affect the liver? Professor Patricia. Okay, so you are asking me if there is other virus that support uh, HPV replication? Yeah, yeah, yes. This is a very important, interesting question because there was one uh, recent paper that suggested that uh, there was other virus that could support, but in our experience, uh, we never, yeah. we don't have any evidence. So I cannot say exists or doesn't exist. Maybe there are, because it would be very strange that there is only one defective virus. So even talking with Mario Rizzetto very often, he suggests that, you know, maybe there are other viruses that support HPV. But so far, we don't have other evidence except the paper that was published recently for the support of HPV. Okay, so the, the, now that is the next question from Natarajan Ravindran, who asks, is there any possibility of developing serum biomarkers for HCC development in HDV? Are there any serum biomarkers for that? This is a very important question, and we are working on this. The problem with the Delta, I tell you what this. The problem with, the with Delta is so difficult to find the very well characterized patients. I'm always asking, I see also George Lau, hi. <laughs> and uh, also Professor Bataku, I'm always talking about uh, with them, about the possibility uh, to do you know, a nice study, enlarge the number. Because if you have very few patients, but very well studied, also, very few patients are not enough. So we should do you know, a kind of big effort, to try to combine more patients in order to have more statistical power when you do a serum biomarker. I'm looking for, in fact, but oh no, also I don't have so many patients, very well characterized patients, yes, but not many. So I think it's very intriguing also the fact that the Delta is in Mongolia, but the, why? Sorry. That, uh, yeah. I mean, sorry. That the Delta is in Mongolia, but and uh, you know, in Mongolia there is not so much HBV. This is very intriguing. So I would be very interested in collaborating with all of you. Uh, so, uh, Professor uh, Farsi, is there any explanation for the geographical distribution of HDV? For example, more in Mongolia, but the nearby area, China and India, there are no HDVs, very less. So, is there any historical reason for this? I mean, uh, I have to tell you that this is one of the most fascinating questions that I'm always asking to myself because uh, it's not very really why. I don't know if there is uh, any genetic or something that uh, does not allow the virus to enter. I, I don't know, but it must be something because especially Mongolia, China and India, I mean, they border. So it's something that I cannot explain, to be mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can explain that, uh, you know, there is other genotypes in South America, you know, that maybe they can give uh, more uh, severe hepatitis related to fulminant. But the fact that does not exist uh, HPV in India and China is very uh, fascinating exist in Mongolia. I would be very interested in studying this kind of patients. Right. Uh, that, there was a very interesting question from Professor Hasmik, who asked that, uh, what is the influence of HDV genotypes on various complications of HDB, for example, cirrhosis development or HCC development? Yeah. So I have to say that uh, there are not, uh, I mean, the most prevalent oh, genotype is genotype 1. So genotype 1 of... Uh, HDV is the one that we know more. And it's not the 
it's so highly uh, diffused, distributed, that probably it allows us to say that the type 1 can give chronic roses and fulminant hepatitis. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, type 3, for instance, is associated with genotype F. So I believe that they might, there must be some differences in the pathogenicity. But I can tell you another thing. I'm studying HPV. I'm studying also the effect of small and large delta antigen. And I'm studying also using chimpanzees, <clears throat> the virological, the valakinetic, and the cytokines and chemokines. We don't know even if delta is the, uh, the disease is immune mediated or is it directly cytopathic? I was very interested. In one. He described that uh, the small delta antigen in a mouse model is directly cytopathic, and, well, and the damage was totally unrelated. And in, in some way, probably this is true, but we need to prove also not only in mice but also in humans, which is not easy. Right. Uh, next, uh, I have a question. <clears throat> uh, Professor Parse. In your opinion, uh, does hepatitis B virus promote hepatitis B virus molecular mechanism to develop HCC? Yeah. Uh, my second question is, I wonder if hepatic stellate cell activation is down regulated, how HDV and liver cirrhosis could be related in hepatocellular carcinoma development? Very important question. I think that uh, there are two major differences with Delta compared to HCV. If you look at the fibrosis induced uh, associated with Delta, you see that 80% of the patients develop cirrhosis within five, 10 years. And actually when I was in Italy that I was seeing many patients at that time with Delta, I could see cirrhosis even in one year and a half in two years. So this is not happening in HCV and in HBV. So the first question is why Delta induce such rapidly progressive disease that it goes immediately from acute hepatitis to cirrhosis? Because I have seen many patients that in one year and a half, they go from, so I'm studying this. I, I don't know what is the relationship, but we are studying the relationship between, uh, you know, doing also gene expression with the hepatic stellate cell to see if there is something peculiar. We are studying also, you know, there was one paper about TGF beta, but I don't think that explain everything. So we are really investigating because I don't know. I mean, even with HCV, it takes 30 years. With HDV, I don't, even with HBV, it's not so rapidly. So I don't know what the Delta is doing in terms of fibro fibrogenesis with, uh, in, in, in this group of patients. Then once they develop cirrhosis, cirrhosis may be stable for some years, but the time that uh, from acute to cirrhosis is very rapid. And to, we are investigating also this aspect. Yes, uh, Patricia. Thank you very much. Yeah. This, Patricia, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, Hi. Sure. So nice to see you uh, in very good shapes. And this is an excellent talk and really appreciate uh, your efforts because of the time zone difference. It must be midnight yeah, for you. About 4.15 in the morning. 4.15 in the morning. <laughs> so well, uh, well uh, we need to applause to uh, your effort. Now, I want to ask uh, one question about your the beautiful studies. Uh, what type of liver, what is the stages of liver cancer you have been looking into? And would um, profiling be affected by the stage of liver cancer? Uh, which yeah, is my following question. Yeah, I have all the details for you. So, all these patients underwent uh, orthotopic liver transplantation. So this means that they didn't have any metastasis, okay? Clear metastasis. Once that the deliver was removed, we did with David Kleiner from the NCI, the stage, okay? The stage and we used the, 
the stage that everybody uses and now it's the stage one, two and three, okay? And uh, we found that uh, all uh, patient with the, there was no difference. For instance, between HBV, HDV or HCV, because they were almost to three. To be honest, there were some HBV were even more advanced, like stage four. So patients with HDV, I think it's also published in the paper, is uh, were almost uh, stage three. Now, we didn't see any reactivation in terms of the tumor, recurrence of the tumor, and there was usually was within the capsule. We saw just in one that there was microvascular invasion. Uh, how about um, those uh, with multinodular HCC? I'm sure that uh, there will be a few patients with more yeah, than one okay. cancer. Sure. Would that That's affect any difference between different uh, nodules or uh, different HCC? Um, so I think that there are two kind of of uh, of patients. One with only one or two nodules, and these are the ones that have been transplanted. The one I studied with the Zamboni with the liver transplantation same. But I can tell you in my experience, I will never forget one patient that was many, many years ago, that he developed a multifocal cancer very rapidly from the acute hepatitis. That, wa that one was with multifocal, in fact, I mean, the patient died quickly and he developed cirrhosis in probably two years, even less. From I followed the patient from the super infection. So I had everything from this patient. And, uh, but overall, I didn't see any difference between, but there is one difference. If you look at, you know, I don't know if you remember my slides, we, we especially in triple we were able to map the entire liver. We found that in HDV, you see much more hyperplasia and regeneration that is not tumor, that you don't see so frequently in HBV or HCV. That was the major difference that we found with, uh, with the pathology. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, and um, um, the, at this point, uh, maybe uh, we should ask our president, uh, uh, um, Professor Tawasa, uh, to um, uh, make a few final comments and also to, uh, about our development of the, our annual meeting, which obviously we would like to invite uh, Professor Fasia to come over. Uh, Professor Tawaski. It's always a pleasure to, you know, to work with all of you also. So I'm always open to any collaboration. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Odef is the one to work with. He is in Mongolia. Yeah, and so, yeah, yes, uh, Professor Tawaski, yeah. uh, could you uh, take over? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for a uh, uh, very nice talk. Thanks for uh, uh, connecting, the, uh, moderating the, the session by Professor Badaku and Professor Sharma. And uh, uh, especially thank you for Professor Farsi for uh, your effort to uh, present this uh, webinar during very early of the day in, in your country. And I would like also to thank Professor Lau for uh, making this webinar on, on behalf of the Apostle to contribute to, uh, to update the hepatology knowledge to our colleagues uh, throughout the world. And uh, please uh, join the, the webinar every Saturday afternoon at four Beijing time. And before I close the session, uh, just to uh, uh, be our guest for the annual meetings of the Apollo. So that's going to be held in Bangkok from uh, 4 to 6 February of 2021. So uh, even uh, we have COVID-19, but the COVID-19 will not compromise our uh, scientific contents of the uh, Apollo annual meeting. We have packed with the full uh, contents and the this is going to be the only um, hybrid meeting in in the world that in in, in this particular time. So for uh, for the liver meetings, uh, that means you can uh, 
actually enjoy the low rate of uh, registration for the virtual meeting. But uh, at the time uh, of the meeting, if the uh, traveling is permitted, you can convert to the uh, physical meeting and still enjoy the low rate of early bird uh, registration for, uh, for the annual meeting as well. So uh, uh, it, uh, now the abstract submissions and registration is all, uh, are open. So please visit the Apostle website and uh, register or submit your abstract for our presentation during the, the, during the meeting. Uh, 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 finally, I would like to thank all of the audience and participants and, on, and, and panelists of this uh, webinar for putting all the effort and for, and for joining our hand during the apostle and the, during this hard time of the COVID-19. So see you next Saturday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. So to go back to your bed. Well, so I hope to see you very soon. Thanks I for everything. Many coffees. <laughs> yes, yes, stupid COVID. <laughs> All right, bye. 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 Professor Farsi, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. Also, as you say, say Mongolia is highest prevalence of hepatitis D and other viral hepatitis and HCC. So I think that means is we can cooperate very effectively uh, in the future and achieve great scientific uh, results. Keep in touch. Thank you very much. You are. It will be a pleasure for me. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank bye, -bye. you. Have a nice evening. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. You're what? Yeah.